I don't want to spend much time via introduction of the series. We started a study knowing the will of God that we are actually going to change in title as we proceed along. It'll be living the will of God. But uh, this is a topic by way of introduction you saw in the notes that, if I could put it this way as a, a, a pastor, having pastored for many years, next to the subject of salvation, this is probably the topic that I addressed more as a pastor in counseling than any other topic that I ever dealt with. People coming and asking questions. One of the psalmists wrote... We see in Psalm 143.10, a text that we put up there yesterday, Teach me to do thy will, O Lord. It's not that it just occurs in that one passage in Scripture. You're going to see it in numerous passages. But the will of God is something that the psalmist said, I wrestle with, I struggle, I need to learn about. We looked at Ephesians 5.17, a New Testament reference. And as you look at it, it says, Wherefore be not unwise, but understanding what the what? Will of the Lord is. Parallel passages to that, Colossians 1.9. In a Colossians 1.9 passage, it speaks especially towards the end. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to a desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of His will. And then we looked at a couple of other passages, Ephesians 1, verses 5 and 9, which speak about something even a little bit different when we talk about the will of God, and that is something what we will be closing our chapel out with today, and that is having predestinated us under the adoption of children by Jesus Christ by, to Himself according to the good pleasure of His will, later on in that passage, having made known unto us the mystery of His will according to His good pleasure which He hath purposed in Himself. Romans 8.28 passage we all know, so you look at it, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. And the will of God then, when we talk about it, has several ideas wrapped up within it. We see that God has a grand will, scheme, design to human history, sometimes referred to as divine counsel or His purpose. Okay, And it's a huge plan. And sometimes it involves then on the individual level. And we speak then of the will of God being on an individual level. Jesus even spoke about that in a John 4.34 and 6.38 passage. Jesus saith unto them, My meat, as He was in Samaria at the well and then right after, is to do the will of Him that sent me and finish His work. God had a purpose for my life, a plan, and I'm about the work that he said. John's passage, as we looked in in chapter 6, verse 38, for I came down from heaven not to do my own, mine own will, but what? The will of him that sent me. And so as we look in these passages of Scripture, it brings us to the topic of God's will in our lives. What does God have for me? And when you and I talk about the will of God, it could talk in reference. And we sometimes use that expression. I put some pictures up here yesterday. Let's go through these quickly. Which college? Now listen, we're going to be talking a lot about that as we come to the a little bit later this morning. And then next week we'll be talking much more about that. Many of us think that the will of God for you is an individual point out there, a target that you must hit. And if I don't hit it, I am out of the will. Or I, let's use this way. Did I miss the will of God? Okay. In other words, there's just one narrow pathway that I can walk down. And if I misstep, I am a what? Out of the will of God. All right? And so when it comes to a college, this was a huge one for many of you. And I'm choosing then between a school in Florida, a school where there's snow. Did I sin if I went to the school in Florida? Did I sin in some of you in a youth group back home when you were met wrestling with this decision last year or three years ago and you sat with the youth pastor and you were looking at and you made four different college trips? Or a trip in which you visited three colleges. Which one is God's will? And if I make a wrong decision, then am I 
permanently out of God's will. And then someone started talking to you. Yeah, if you choose the wrong college, you could meet the wrong mate, marry the wrong person. They could influence you. You could end up doing this instead of being in that country as a missionary. And then you're just the rest of your life completely out of God's will. You ever thought along those lines? Which college? Big decision. Going on to marriage. If marriage. Who in marriage? We kept on asking other questions. Purchasing a home, renting an apartment, what's the wisest decision? Record number of foreclosures in our nation like we've never seen before. A lot of those are affecting Christians as well. And so, were we out of God's will when we bought a home at a subprime rate here two years ago and now we are losing it? Next question. Which career to pursue? Teaching, medical, missions, Chick-fil-A, McDonald's. Where do I go? What do I do? Children, family. And as we talked, and that picture is by no accident. We said yesterday, the picture of the baby, by the way, is, what's her name? Anna, okay? Anna Grace, Charlotte's granddaughter, all right? And uh, so as you look at the, the picture, one child? Some people pray about, should we have any children? After all, and, and listen, there are people, we're praying about the will of God. I've counseled numerous young couples. We don't feel we ought to have children because um, financially it just doesn't fit, fit in our picture. Okay? We wanted to travel. We wanted to see the world. Children would be an anchor to us. And it's like, and I've sat them down as, look me in the eyes. Um, you have things in your life you need to work on. Okay? such as greed and selfishness. And then I just went through a whole... And they'd get upset with me, but that's life, okay? And uh, if you're thinking along those lines, we've got issues. But sometimes an Old Testament passage, be fruitful and multiply. God would say to Adam and Eve or to Noah. And if you are trying to keep up with Adam and Eve or Noah and have that many children, things might get difficult, okay? And so we need to exercise wisdom about what God would have us to do in the matter of both the number and how we raise those children. Okay? We'll talk more about that in application as we get there. We raised some questions, and if you look on the handout that we gave yesterday, ask you to bring it along because we're going to work our way through this study, this handout. Page one of the handout, then. We started by saying, as we talk about this matter concerning the will of God, and by way of review, simply saying this. You and I are not an apostle or a prophet. You and I are not to wait for a call, as if I'm waiting for God to do something out of the blue, or I just let the Spirit lead me. You and I, when it comes to decision-making, are going to have to wrestle with data and facts to make wise decisions all the time in our lives. And what that's going to take as we do that is a deep search of the Word of God, prayer then to understand the things we read in the Word of God, wise counsel. We will have to look at what's happening in our lives, the events. You're going to have to look at some other things on how God wired you. We'll talk about that in a moment. But what I'm doing and what we talked about yesterday in points 1, 2, and 3 on pages 1 and 2 is the fact that you and I do not have the breaking into our lives and God audibly speaking to you, showing you in a dream or a vision, the way He did occasionally, didn't happen to all believers, but occasionally in the past, at a time when there was not a body or a canon of revelation that you have on your lap today. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness that the man, woman of God may be what? Thoroughly what? Furnished. In other words, what I need is here. Ha! Huh. But there are then other dynamics then that, as I look at the Word, that apply to me. And it takes great discernment. Page 2, our fourth principle. You should not trust your feelings alone. Follow along as I read, and I've written a lot of this out. 
please, so that you have this. It's not so that it's a teaching lesson in chapel, but there are things we are saying. And after chapel yesterday, through the day, I've had numerous visitors and folks talking to me. By visitors, I don't mean visitors to campus. I mean visitors to my office, stopping in and saying, I have to ask you a question about something I'm wrestling with. When it comes to discerning the Word of God, some of us on occasion have really gone on with the idea of, well, um, I throw out some fleeces and, I, and, and, and I've read books that teach me to do that. Uh, and then you really have to trust the, the peace that God gives you once you do that. Let me bring that into check for just a moment. Christians have often said, God showed me or God told me that. Notice on your notes here. Such statements can be dangerously misleading. I pastored a church where we did a church plant. And then I pastored another church that had an established ministry when I came, 26 years. But in the first church that I pastored, it was a church plant. We started with a handful of people, and then it grew to several hundred. But along the way, most of those people were first-generation Christians. They were, in their background, a lot like me. Many of them did not, had never heard the word saved before they became a believer. They, had never, they couldn't find Paul. They couldn't differentiate him from Saul. Didn't know if David was in the front half, back half of a butt. Matter of fact, did not know where you'd find Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. They didn't know any of that. I had never read a Bible before 21. Oh, in junior high, I had read the book of Leviticus. In the Catholic Church, it was they, they wanted to teach us Bible, so they had all of us read Leviticus. The Bible became just super boring to me. If this is what this book is, so you're a seventh grader unsaved reading Leviticus. I mean, you know, it was either sit, have religion class and walk from the public school to the religious center where we went for CDC classes, or... I learned after about three weeks of studying Leviticus, just cut out, go play football, go back, clean up so you don't look like you were skipping. But what is this book? The next time I picked it up, I'm 21. So what's my knowledge of the Word of God? A whole lot less than any of us here have. Okay? Imagine a whole church full of people like that, and you have a music group come from a Bible college or a Christian liberal arts college, and I would bring them in, and they would sing in our church services, and the students, the music ensembles would say, yesterday God told me, or God showed me in His Word. God spoke to me last night. The people in our church went, whoa, Pastor, there's something you're holding out. Uh, these young people... Are, we're not hearing what they're hearing. And, I'm, and I had to tell them, like, this, they ain't hearing either, okay? They, they, honestly, they're not hearing anything. That's a euphemism or an expression to say, as they read the Word of God, the things they were reading just touched, spoke, enlightened their hearts. You get it? Okay. And so they were seeing things, and out of that, God convinced them of something very important. He did not speak or tell us or reveal anything new to us. What we mean is we have become convinced, and underline those words, we have become convinced that God is at work in our lives in this matter. God spoke to me. I use that expression today. God told me. God showed me. God spoke to me. And it simply means, man, I read that and I've, the Spirit of God's convinced me about that. Second paragraph, it's not always possible to identify the cause or source then of those feelings. Who has not had their, had their emotions stirred, tears prompted by beautiful music, sympathy, feelings of guilt, or a sad story told by a minister? We may interpret these emotions as due to the Spirit's work or as the result of the soft hearts which we have as believers sensitive, but we should not forget that unbelievers also have feelings. It is all too easy to confuse and quite difficult to distinguish between our own emotions and the work of the Spirit. Where I'm going with this is this. There's a whole lot of times when I'm in the middle of the will of God and have absolutely no peace. If I could use the expression or I'll use the idea of not so much peace, but joy. Can I use that term instead? Joy at what's happening. You just get word that you have leukemia. How deep is the joy running? It's not. 
You just receive word. Your mother, father, sister is now with the Lord. The joy? Probably every Bible college registrar can cite an example of a successful businessman saved very late in life, immediately feeling that he should forsake his business ties, prepare for some full-time Christian ministry. After a year of difficult grades, study habits had long since gone, marital strife, he was convinced his wife wasn't, family difficulties, frayed nerves, spiritual deterioration in his own life, he begins to wonder about the source of his feelings. The fact is we cannot know whether our feelings are from God or not all the time. We can test our feelings by the Scriptures, in some cases determine that they are not from God. But even if we find no Scripture to contradict our feelings, this does not provide proof that they are from God. Once we begin to assume an equation that our feelings and the guidance of the Spirit, the tendency is to become experience-oriented rather than Scripture-oriented. Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon thee. Peace that passes understanding. When we talk about peace in that sense, it doesn't mean joyfully peaceful. Paul, when he writes about a peace that passes understanding, is in prison. Joseph in a prison, Daniel in a lion's den. Was there a joy about that? Well, there's a sense of peace in the sense that there can be an assurance in the midst of the deepest trials or a reassurance that I am walking with God in spite of this situation or circumstance. That, and there's Job. Job's friends come. Eliphaz, Bildad, Zophar, later Elihu, are going to come and challenge him that, Job, there's something wrong in your life. These things just don't happen to righteous people. And Job is convinced, as he goes on, that I am walking right with God. When I look on the right hand, I do not see him. And I look on the left, I do not see him, Job 26. Or before me, I don't understand where God is leading or what is happening. I don't understand all this. But when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. I know that I am right with God in spite of the circumstance. Was he troubled? Absolutely. Deep sense of peace? Well, not in the sense of everything is peaceful and joyous. But in my heart, there is a calm assurance that even though everything around me is traumatic and devastating, I am right with God. Now, that's what Paul is talking about, a peace that passes my human understanding of trying to explain the future and what's going on. And you and I need to live there. But sometimes your boat is going to be rocked. And I'm really troubled by one of my professors confronting me. I've never had anybody do the Dutch uncle, put their arm around me and talk to me and say, you ought not to act like that. And by doing that, you are really causing friction in your unit. I've never had anybody confront me so forwardly. And, and I'm not at peace about it. And therefore, it's not God's will to be here. That's a misunderstanding of the peace of God. Does that make sense to us? Okay. No, you are just now being brought in line with Scripture. You need not identify your gifts. In other words, what you put the slides up, what vocation, what career path. Nowhere does the Bible instruct us, be sure you can identify your spiritual gifts. Some have actually implied that one dare not serve the Lord until he or she has determined what their gifts are. How does one determine whether or not they have the gift of teaching, assuming that they must do so? By revelation, by having others tell you, and whether or not one is gifted in teaching or evangelism or administration, there are times when you must do the best job possible in spite of your own weaknesses. Besides, spiritual gifts and abilities may be given by God at any time in your life and are not to be developed and improved by usage. They may be, but doesn't mean that that is how God has always determined that. The passages which devote the most attention 
to the matter of spiritual gifts were not written to tell us how to discover or identify them. And by the way, you can go online and get, pay and buy a computer test that will help you identify your spiritual gift. Okay? Um, don't do that. Okay? But to correct misunderstanding and misuse by immature Christians. Notice, see, the New Testament emphasizes that spiritual graces are far more important than spiritual gifts. Paul spoke then of a more excellent way, not merely uh, a way of seeking gifts and using, but as a more excellent way than seeking and using them, which then says provides a better road or path rather than merely a better manner. And it's to be pursued, whereas gifts are merely desirable. When Paul gave instructions regarding the selection of spiritual leaders, he never said, look for spiritual gifts. Rather, he listed character qualities. 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7. Christian leader, he said, should have a good reputation in a community. Faithful husband, sober-minded, well-behaved, hospitable, not a drunkard, not a brawler, not greedy, etc. The only phrase, apt to teach, could possibly be understood as requiring a specific gift. But according to several theological dictionaries, it can also be translated not only teach, able to teach, but also implies teachable and able to learn. Apt, then, the idea... Uh, it is far more necessary to be teachable than to be teacher. So, the New Testament never speaks then of a spiritual gift as exempting us from other responsibilities. Too often the attitude could be, my gift is teaching, preaching, administration, and therefore I have no responsibility in giving, evangelism, whatever. Even if you do identify a gift... You are not thereby exempted from other obligations. All of us are to be doing those other things. And with that, then, I give this conclusion. It may be concluded, then, that an emphasis upon each believer searching to be able to identify and list their spiritual gifts is not a biblical emphasis. Such an emphasis often leads to this unhealthy, excessive introspection or a reliance on feelings and self-deception. You will have to, and we're going to get to that in a few minutes, you are going to have to figure out how you are wired, how you are talented, what your interests are, and you better figure them out in a dating relationship. Okay? You don't date other people that you don't like. And what don't you like about them? Well, look. And... And I've had people say to me, you know, that have had difficulties in relation only. They've said, I remember in a counseling situation, a guy and a wife are sitting there and he's saying to his wife, I, we, we, we have trouble because we're just so different and don't get along well. And it's like, you should have thought of that a while back. And she's getting upset and she's, she said to me, Pastor, look at me. Would, would you love me? You know, would you marry me, I think was the question. I remember sharing that with Lucy. She's, and it's like, how do I get out of that without lying? You know, it's like, it's like no one, I'm not sure why he did. But you can't say that. The, 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 the point is, is that God has wired us. In other words, our backgrounds and whatnot are different. Bottom line, even in a college, there are some places and some areas where, frankly, the way you are made or your background or your culture, you're going to have a difficult time fitting in. And so, well, and you've seen that as missionaries come. Could God use you in this culture? Maybe not. Probably not. Perhaps not. You are better adapted because you can relate well to that. You have to think about things like that. And they'll come into play. And so, when we talk about giftedness, well, I'm waiting to serve until God reveals all these knots. And there's one more. You should avoid several common, strange ideas. We're knocking down some ideas. And we said we'd take two days to do this. Because it says, be not unwise, even Ephesians 5.17. But know what the will of God is. There are some things sometimes we have to clear away before we can get down to the right thing. One of them is this, and I want to read in just a moment. God's will, notice on page 3, is not mystical. It's not a mystery, as if it is something hidden. Number two, God is not vindictive. You ever play hide and seek? 
with your parents or with your kids or with a younger brother or sister. It's like, I'm never going to reveal myself to them, no matter how hard they... And it's like we do that with the will of God. It's so hidden, I can't find it. From the testimonies of some Christians, it's possible to receive the distinct impression that God forces us to do whatever seems most undesirable to us. You and I have heard repeatedly people say, boy, the one place I never wanted to go was Africa. The one place I never wanted to go was Cleveland. And that's understandable. But the one I didn't want to go to those places. And look where God called me. It's a, the idea almost is that anything you hate, God's going to make you do. It's like, I had to die on a cross. That was bad. Now wait till I get even with you. It, God doesn't think like that. He doesn't even go down those avenues. He's a God of love. God's will also is not lost. When someone says, I'm trying to discover God's will for my life, I'm tempted to reply, is it lost? Has He hid it? Of course not. God has desired for you in your life and He wants you to know that. Colossians 1, 9. Now, notice as we look then on the sheet, page 4, if you'll go there lastly, you and I, as we talk about some of the things in the will of God, and what God's will or isn't. Brings you to that sheet that I gave you today, the newest handout. In a moment, let's, well, let's bring that up, if we can. As Dustin brings that one up, you and I need to distinguish now, as we go into the positive of this discussion, about God's will. And what we're going to talk about next week is that God has, notice on page four, when we use the term will of God, you have to start thinking now in scriptural terms in two categories. One talks about history. It talks about how Jesus Christ in the mind of God, in the foreknowledge of God, and determined counsel, meaning the determined will of God. So as you look here, you're going to see that God's Word speaks about something often referring to history. In all of history, there is a first advent. There is a second coming of Christ. We don't know when. Prior to His actual time on earth, there will be a tribulation period. Christ will come. He will establish His kingdom. There will then be, following that, a great white throne judgment. Those things are determined. Paul talks about how we must all appear before the Bema Seat of Christ. Judgment Seat. We will. It's determined. There are also in the Word of God things that God speaks about that He wants for every human being. Not just history, but human beings. And one of the problems with human beings is when He created us in His image, He gave us a free, say it, free what? Will. The free will is now marred like everything else after the fall. Meaning what? God has a desire for every human being. Do you have to do the desires? No. What does God desire? We're going to see that not willing that any should perish, but all will see salvation. Brethren, I beseech you by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this, what? World, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable, perfect what? Will of God. He wants us sanctified. We'll talk more about that in 1 Thessalonians. He wants us spirit-filled, Ephesians 5. We already referenced that. We'll come back to that. He wants us to all authorities to be submissive. We'll come back to that. That, he says in 1 Peter 2, is the will of God. He wants us to be willing to suffer. Whoa. If so be that the will of God is for you. We'll see an extended passage in that. Those are God's desires for every one of us. So when it talks about God's desires... There are desires like saved, spirit-filled, sanctified, submissive, willing to endure suffering for His cause. 
Those are God's desires. And those have been, notice, declared in the Word of God, what His desires are for us. So underneath that, there are declared desires. We'll study at length. But the problem, who to marry, which job, whatever, they are what? Undeclared. You don't have a voice, something existential. It's undeclared. Now you have to operate with principles from the Word of God. Wise counseling, prayer, bringing events of your life, background. You have to bring all that together. That's the stuff we wrestle with. That's the decision-making process we go through. Let me take you to another slide here. If we can bring it up. This is the bottom one on your sheet. We're talking about then the will of God. And here's where our study now goes. We're not going to talk about the determined will for history. We're going to talk about the will of God for each individual. Can you back that one out with the undeclared desires for a moment? If you were to take life as a circle, rather than... And that's... In the circle of... Oh, that sounds Disney-esque. Okay, but in the circle of life, if we could use that, your life, all right? There's your life. And as you look at it, God's declared word principles for you are that He would like you saved, spirit-filled, sanctified, submissive, willing to endure suffering. That's what God has declared that He desires for each of you, for me. He desires that of us, okay? And He's told us, you don't have to do those, okay? It's a choice. You don't have to be saved. You don't have to. We can. He gives you the option of not having to live with Him for eternity anymore. He's not going to force you and me, once you're saved, to... Read the Word of God. You do not have to pray. It's commanded, but some of you aren't. So you know you haven't been struck by lightning yet. Meaning, I'm getting by. You can get by without doing that. Point is, that's what God has already told us in His Word. In other words, to be right with God and walking with God and to refuse to declare or follow what He has declared, He wants and expects of His children is what? Therefore, to Him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, it is, we're out of step with God. You and I must be doing that, and as we do the declared desires... Next slide, then. You're going to see that, actually, we're going to call it, when you are living out God's desires for you, then you can delight yourself in the Lord and He will give you the what? He will put desires in His heart, your heart, that align with Him. And you will find the decisions of marriage and college and whatnot, then within this, I'll be making my decisions within the will of God. All right? And you're going to see then that rather than just a point, I'm actually operating within categories. So, can I come to Clearwater Christian College? And am I out of the will of God if I change major? When I came here, I was certain my major was pre-med. And he's drawn my heart to Christian school teaching. Am I still in the will of God? as a saved, sanctified, spirit-filled, willing to submit to God Christian. All you have to do is ask your youth pastor, and who's going, I'm not sure I believe that. And then next year he changes his mind and feels God's calling him to be a pastor. I thought you told us God's will was to be a youth pastor. How about your pastor who felt he should become a teacher? Or a missionary who felt I should teach in a Bible college. Or a Bible college teacher who felt they should become a missionary. Are they now out of the will? How come God keeps changing His mind? 
Because maybe the will of God, you can fit within what I'm doing. Does that make sense? It's not a point. It can be, I'm within the will of God. By the way, some of you are wrestling who to date, who to marry, if to marry, which career. Let me, let, me, let me lay something out to you that we'll deal with. If you're not saved or spirit-filled or sanctified, stuff, if you're not willing to do the things that God has declared, it's going to get pretty foggy out there and bumpy when you want to start making and finding the will of God in my individual choices. Does it make sense? That circle isn't centered anymore. That thing gets lopsided, even moved without. The point being is, if I'm harboring sin or what, then you're going to have to do the existential. Because you're not hearing from God. Okay? He's telling you, obey me, and then I'll guide you. Delight thyself in the Lord. And then those other things will line up. But your delights have to be what? His delights. It's a good point to close. Let's stand, have a word of prayer, and be dismissed. Keep this sheet. The next ones we give you will follow along on that one sheet we gave today. We'll have more handouts coming. Father, thank you for the time today. Pray that it will be profitable and probably one of the most debated, discussed topics in the entire Christian life. Give us wisdom and insight and guidance. Please, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.